The new AIMS method for pool testing is being applied in a number of countries. In addition to Rwanda, it's also been used in the Gambia. There is a, a university in the UK that's looking to use our method to screen its students regularly. In South Africa in particular, we're hoping to expand the application of the method also to screening uh, students. One of the lessons we're learning from the COVID-19 pandemic is that having a good scientific base, having good researchers, having good infrastructure, having institutions like AIMS is very important for the response. Because when you go into a population, you don't know who has the disease. You need some guidance in order to use resources efficiently. Mathematics is a wonderful tool for providing that guidance. And so having an our, an excellent scientific base really is, is the foundation we need to solve problems like pandemics and to solve every other problem that impedes the development of the continent. The AIMS method uh, for pool testing is applicable to diseases other than COVID-19. For example, it can be used to screen people for malaria or any other infection, any other disease uh, from which we can get the uh, samples uh, one of the important lessons we've learned from this, uh, this, our interactions um, with people who are at the front line solving, you know, addressing the problem uh, of COVID-19 and those who are at the background designing uh, solutions uh, to problems is the importance of thinking across disciplines. So this is very important and at AIMS we are very keen to attract people with this kind of mindset. The method is uh, free of charge. Um, we're making it available to the public, to humanity free of charge. We really want to be catalysts of human progress in Africa and outside the continent. So currently countries that are interested in using this method to test their citizens, uh, their, their residents, um, are free to contact us and we'll, we'll support them as much as possible to deploy the method in their countries. housekeeping issues, please uh, feel free to post comments and questions in the Q&A session. Um, um, I do have some questions here, but would love to hear from the audience as well. Um, I know this is a hot topic. Um, so our first question starts with the uh, global response to both Ebola and COVID-19. Um, and um, uh, the main question we have here is, what is the difference between how governments and the WHO have responded uh, to COVID-19 and Ebola, which um, of course um, has been devastating Africa over the last 10 years. Um, so um, we'll take first some comments in French from Dr. Alpha Keita. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, I'm going to give my answer in French. I'm more comfortable in this language. Uh, bon, comment on dit euh, disons que l'épidémie de la maladie à coronavirus a commencé en Chine euh, et, et ça a un tout petit peu effrayé le monde entier avec euh, les chiffres qui venaient de la Chine, les chiffres de mortalité, les chiffres d'hospitalisation, ainsi de suite, et passé par l'Europe avant d'atteindre l'Afrique. Donc, euh, les organisations comme euh, l'OMS, l'Organisation mondiale de la santé, et disons-le, les décisionnaires en, en santé des différents pays ont été suivis par euh, la vitesse de propagation du virus, l'ampleur que le virus prenait euh, en Europe, et euh, les gens ont suivi que l'Afrique, qui est euh, totalement habitué à des épidémies beaucoup plus meurtrières comme Ebola, euh, euh, enregistre une très faible létalité liée à la maladie à coronavirus. Donc, cette faible létalité a dans un euh, euh, temps, disons, poussé les gens à, 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 à donner des hypothèses qui sont des hypothèses euh, qu'on ne peut pas considérer comme des hypothèses qui visuellement euh, ne concorde pas avec la réalité que beaucoup de pays vivent en Afrique. Ça, c'est un premier aspect du problème. Donc, disons que l'Organisation mondiale de la santé, euh, qui est censée être un organisme supranational, euh, a 
considérer l'épidémie à coronavirus euh, comme les autres épidémies qui ont l'habitude de survenir dans différents continents, principalement l'Afrique. Donc, les hypothèses ont été émises par rapport à, disons, la, 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 la létalité présumée pouvant être attribuée au virus, en Afrique particulièrement, où les gens prévoyaient un, un, une fois que le virus aurait franchi les limites du continent, ce qui n'a pas été le cas. Donc, euh, dans du monde, en Afrique ou en Amérique, ont adressé l'épidémie en fonction euh, de leurs dispositifs existants, des moyens qu'ils avaient à leur disposition et les moyens vraiment euh, n'ont pas été à la hauteur euh, de l'ampleur de l'épidémie. Ce qu'on peut dire, c'est que l'OMS avait sa logique pour la gestion de l'épidémie. L'épidémie, les gouvernements avaient leur logique concernant la gestion de l'épidémie. Une première différence se situe à ce niveau. C'est-à-dire que si on prend euh, l'Europe, au début, la plupart des pays pensaient que l'épidémie est lointaine, c'est en Chine, ça ne va pas arriver à, à, à en Europe, ça a faussé tous les pronostics. L'épidémie les gens n'étaient pas tout à fait prêts à faire face à la réalité de l'épidémie, ce qui a entraîné un taux complet et euh, a entraîné, disons, ce que nous voyons, un taux de vitalité de beaucoup de personnes en réanimation, un taux d'infection dans la population très élevé. Il faut se dire aussi que cet aspect dans ces endroits du monde sont liés à, aux politiques de dépistage qui ont été mises en place et euh, Donc, en Afrique, par contre, continent habitué à, à beaucoup d'épidémies, des épidémies plus ou moins meurtrières, comme les gens dans ces endroits étaient plus ou moins prêts à faire face à une épidémie beaucoup plus importante euh, euh, que Ebola ou euh, l'ampleur que euh, la, la maladie à coronavirus est en train de montrer à la face du monde. Donc, la plupart de ces pays ont profité euh, des anciennes épidémies pour mettre en place des personnes qui sont malades. Et donc, euh, en Afrique, on enregistre, par exemple, euh, disons, Beaucoup moins de cas. Dans la plupart des pays en Afrique, les gens n'ont pas appliqué une politique de dépistage massif. Donc, peut-être qu'il y a plus de cas en population qui ne développent pas des formes graves de la maladie. Mais les personnes qui arrivent dans les structures de soins sont des personnes qui développent des formes moyennes ou des formes sévères de la maladie. Et en ce sens, ces personnes qui arrivent à l'hôpital sont des personnes qui meurent moins que dans les autres continents. Donc, il faut se dire que les, les, les politiques, en quelque sorte, ont été euh, plus ou moins drivées par les gouvernements et les suivre. Voilà, dans le même temps, c'est ce que je peux dire. I, th I think we're struggling a little bit with the audio, uh, but I'll ask the other panelists, maybe Dr. Robert, do you have um, a, any comments on the coordinated response um, in Africa from the WHO or from the African Union, for example, um, and the difference between that response to COVID-19 and Ebola? Um, uh, thank you uh, very much. I'll, I'll make it short. I think that um, we saw that there have been some differences that we've seen in, in, in the 2014-2015 Ebola crisis um, and then the later crisis, uh, I would say 2018-19 in DRC and the COVID response. Um, whereas um, in the West African response, uh, uh, outbreaks, it was more uh, regional. Uh, for, for, for COVID, we, we've seen a lot more collaboration. You've seen networking with Africa CDC 
um, and WHO on the ground. So it, it's not only uh, the country uh, response, but you've seen a bit more of um, well, of a network uh, that is building around COVID. It could also be uh, we can look at the, the fact that the pathogens are different and, and the fact the, the, the manner in which they spread uh, are also different. But um, what is important that one can uh, say quickly here is that we have learned from Ebola. We have learned from some of the weaknesses in the health system response that we had. And it, it seems that for COVID, um, there has been some improvement in that area. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and uh, this the, the, the next question is one of my favorite questions as an immunologist um, who understands that, you know, in, the immune system is as variable as it can be uh, among different people. So I have a question for Professor Janine. Um, what do you think were the key ingredients in ensuring that COVID-19 is not as deadly in Africa as it has been for other parts of the world? Um, I know there's a lot of theories about, um, you know, the different age groups, um, uh, different vaccination programs, and of course the coordinated national governments. But um, from your point of view, um, what do you think the, um, the difference in the risk factors in Africa have been? All right, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I was saying that I'm uh, honored actually to be here and to share my point of view as a researcher and public health. So may probably dif uh, differ from you as a immunologist, but definitely, you know, from all the research that we are doing here uh, in Rwanda, but also in East Africa, we are seeing exactly um, a very low, I mean, cases compared to Western um, countries. So we, we, we try to think, and actually right now I'm doing an EAC evaluation COVID and see uh, what actually were the responses, you know, across government and what could be those factors. So, so, you know, straightforward, you know, giving the example of Rwanda, I think uh, the leadership is key, starting by there. Leadership is key in terms of uh, taking seriously uh, the lives of people, the lives of, of population. So here again, you know, the coordination and, and the national uh, response team, everyone was informed and, and committed to work as a team. And here we're not only talking about the government, we are talking about the private sector, we are talking about everyone who was um, informed and at the time that um, because probably it started in China and also Western countries, we were a little bit prepared in a sense, mentally, um, to take it seriously. Um, and then, you know, from the government perspective, I think also you said it very well. Um, we live in a way uh, that is a little bit different from Western countries where people live in apartment. Uh, we are not yet there. So here the, the open space is also could be contribution. Uh, one of the contributor factors uh, of uh, low cases. We are looking at the age. Know that we should also, uh, if you look at the age, medium age in Africa, we are looking about 21 years as opposed to where COVID is deadly, we are seeing the population is a little bit aging. And, and lastly, what I wanted to say is, you know, we learn also from Ebola. There are many, many outbreaks that are happening. Uh, for example, the case of Rwanda and, and also the case of Uganda and DRC, we're able to put some measures uh, in place, including cross-border measures, including a wash, um, hand wash stations, um, use of alcohol, uh, try to avoid using the, you know, the paperwork, using cards that you can scan by yourself. So I'll pause here and, and probably uh, I think it's more about leadership, commitment and public health measures. Um, also probably the immunity will come later when, you know, we'll figure out whether or not the TB vaccine was part of it. Uh, but I definitely those preventive measures uh, matter. Over. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Janine. Um, um, Alpha, do you have any additional comments that you would like to add um, on what Africa had um, a milder response uh, compared to other countries? Donc, je disais, je dis l'ampleur réelle, l'ampleur réelle, l'ampleur réelle de la maladie à coronavirus en Afrique peut être un peu méconnue parce que La plupart des pays, comme je le disais dans ma première intervention, n'ont pas, euh, d'une certaine façon, fait une politique de dépistage massif au sein de leur population. Cependant, je le disais tantôt, les gens qui sont tombés malades et qui sont arrivés dans les hôpitaux ont, d'une certaine façon, mieux résisté que dans les pays d'Europe. Et ça, 
des hypothèses sont en train de les lier à la jeunesse de la population africaine et aussi au fait que ces populations aient été d'une certaine façon exposées à, à, à des espèces de coronavirus qui étaient connues avant et qui sont responsables de quand même 15 à 30% des rues euh, banaux. Et d'une certaine façon, ces coronavirus pourraient contribuer à la protection de ces populations-là et qui ferait que euh, les gens résistent mieux à la maladie en Afrique. Alors. Donc, il y a euh, quelque chose à creuser dans ce sens pour essayer de comprendre pourquoi les populations africaines ont mieux résisté à la maladie et que le résultat est moins mauvais que ce que toutes les prédictions disaient au début de l'épidémie. Voilà, c'est ce que je peux ajouter comme commentaire. Thank you, Dr. Alpha. So I, I will deviate a little bit from our plan and um, ask a question that came from the audience. Um, and either Francesco or, or Robert, you can uh, address this question. Uh, what do you think the WHO insight is on the globalization of this coming COVID-19 uh, vaccine? This is a very timely question and we have a lot of lessons inspired from the Ebola vaccine um, uh, research and development. Do you have any um, insight on that? I mean, I'm glad to, I, I don't know about WHO insight, but I can talk a little bit about the type of work that, that we've been doing and where this might apply. Um, so my background is more of a, I'm a computer scientist and mathematician by trade. Um, and my work is in the realm of, of optimization and incentives. And I do think well, there are some subtle issues that people are starting to think about in terms of allocations of vaccines its limited resource and the whole decision-making process of to whom should vaccines go. And, um, and uh, we, we can treat this as an optimization problem as well. Um, there are different objectives. We can think about the objective of having people return to society in normalcy. C certain individuals have a higher priority to return to society versus others, or also the priorities in terms of um, risk factors, as we've seen, for example, here in the UK where the first vaccines are going to be rolled out to people who are more at risk or to healthcare workers. But at the same time, you can make the case for using vaccines to mitigate the propagation of the virus. Uh, should you vaccinate, for example, young people who are not at risk, but for example, here, at least in Oxford, are propagating the virus throughout the population. Um, so one perhaps insight and something that we're looking at is whether we can treat this question as an optimization problem. How can we allocate these things, uh, optimizing set objectives, uh, if we specify this, but Um, again, I, I defer, I guess, more towards, uh, towards all of you who, who have much more know-how in terms of the actual after effects of this and um, in, in terms of public health, in terms of how this might actually impact the spread of the virus too. So the, Dr. Francesco, so I know computer scientists look at optimization in a, in a very specific and technical way. So can you give us more insight on what you mean by that and how that can be applied to the public health setting? Um, definitely. Um, uh, so one way, for example, that this can be applied is um, if you if you identify specific metrics that you want to try to improve um, over time. And some very reasonable metrics, for example, are the R factor of the virus. And uh, you can think about um, if, if you had, for example, a simulation of the population uh, with infection in certain places and you think about a policy that effectively chooses distinct individuals in the population according to attributes that you can measure. Um, say, for example, the exposure of an individual, if you can have a broad categorization of, of how connected this person is to others. These, you can think about this as potential super spreaders. Then you might be able to quantify the if this person was infected, on average, how many other people would this person infect? And this incurs a specific cost um, in terms of the R factor. Um, and so th this is one way, and I hope that this answers the question, that you can specifically write down a, a mathematical equation and, uh, and accordingly come up with a policy that optimally says, according to these parameters that you witness, vaccinate this person. Of course, this all comes with a grain of salt. I don't think any reasonable policymaker should be blindly listening to an algorithm. But, uh, but I think that this could just be another element of the toolbox for public policy to kind of highlight the, the fact that there exist um, potential alternatives than what might seem to be uh, the, the natural thing to do. And, and, and this is something that we've seen with testing. And I know we'll, we'll definitely get to this topic in due time, so I don't want to necessarily jump the gun on that. Um, but there are some 
non-trivial ways in which you can allocate these resources that actually benefit the overall objective. And, and this is where computer science and mathematics can give insight to policymakers to just have that in their repertoire. Yeah, great response. Thank you for that. So um, I will pass it back to Dr. Robert because I know you have some insight from the uh, Africa Risk um, uh, a group that um, specifically addresses the strategy with regard to um, vaccine and vaccine distribution. Do you have any insight either from your group or from the Africa CDC um, uh, regarding that? We are not working Africa risk capacity. I thank you also uh, for, for being part of the panel. The, we don't work directly in, in, in vaccine uh, distribution or the vaccine area, but of course, in our collaboration with the Africa CDC and also uh, with WHO and others, we are aware of the the continents, uh, the, the COVID uh, group, uh, including um, Gavi and others that are ensuring that um, there is access and equitable distribution of these vaccines when they come online uh, uh, for the continent. But from the public health side, there are a number of other factors that needs to be looked at. Um, production of, of these vaccines, cold chain uh, distribution of these vaccines, and also eventually we need to look at a patent release uh, for these vaccines uh, production in, in regions where the capacity uh, is, um, and in, it will be in, in, in certain parts of the continent and certain parts of, 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 of uh, other areas. So cost is an issue that needs to be looked at. Um, I'm hearing co-payment and, and placing of orders. So um, the vaccines are going to be in short supply. So uh, we need all to prime ourselves uh, to um, uh, respond to our frontline uh, staff and then most vulnerable first perhaps uh, in, in, in uh, the response that comes on. Thank you. So this is a nice segue to our, uh, oh. Before that, I, I see Francesco. You have a comment, a response to that. I, I just, I just wanted to quickly say that uh, one, one final thing is, and this was mentioned in the video, and uh, and in part, um, Robert was talking about this right now, is that all of this, of course, there's an emphasis, there, and there should be an emphasis on multidisciplinary work, and that's the, kind of like the final thing that I wanted to say. That uh, ultimately, there, and it's something that we've learned with with our work, but that um, in any, for example, vaccine allocation, one needs to talk to. Um, medical professionals, public health professionals, but also possibly um, people with behavioral psychology or game theorists, people who that there, there are multiple other things that we've seen with this pandemic that uh, have completely opened our eyes to just simply for human behavior. Um, what do we do with people who don't want to take vaccines? What do we do, for example, as is the case in some places like Germany, where um, people might be apprehensive to take the vaccine, even, even though they're not necessarily anti-vaccine? And um, th this idea that they approve of the vaccine, but just temporarily not for myself. And uh, these entire kind of game theoretic issues and strategic issues are also really important. And I, I just wanted to kind of quickly say before we move on and uh, that I think that what Ames is doing and what uh, everyone here is, is, is talking about is that this multidisciplinary approach is, is essential for such a wide problem like the pandemic. Thank you for that. So vaccine hesitancy is a real and broad topic, which I think deserves its own panel discussion at this point. Um, but um, addressing the, the flip side, which is uh, what are the healthcare systems capacities to actually even, um, um, you know, address the pandemic, not just from the vaccination angle, but vaccination diagnosis treatment. Um, I have a question for you, Dr. Robert, um, regarding um, what we have learned from COVID-19 and Ebola uh, responses, what do you think the government should put in place to ensure that the next pandemics don't cause the same level of shock to the system and the same level that, um, you know, um, the healthcare systems have actually been crippled by the response to both uh, pandemics? Okay, um, thank you again. Um, I think that first, the recognition that they are, we are dealing with different pathogens and and, and how they affect and you know, their behavior and how we respond to them are different, uh, must be established. But um, during the Ebola crisis, I think we saw a bit more uh, unpreparedness and, and weak uh, response in, in the area of surveillance and, and uh, lab testing and, and things of that nature. There's been some improvement uh, in the 2018 uh, GRC. And also I think COVID has primed a lot of our governments uh, in, in responding much better to, to that. So there, there are a few lessons that, that have come up that we can pick up. But um, 
two areas that I think um, we must look at, or a few, I should say. One is the burden on, on, on health workers. I mean, um, during the Ebola crisis, uh, we, we had a lot of health workers that have, have and the same is occurring for this, is, is the stress, the trauma, um, and, and the fact that health care systems are inundated with that. Another area that we tend not to focus on is, is the secondary effects of, uh, of, of, of these. For example, during the Ebola crisis in 2014, we, while we recorded around 11,300 thereabouts deaths in uh, Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone, there were about 10,600 deaths uh, related to HIV and HTB and malaria. Um, and a, a similar uh, 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 um, a study that has been done recently is also showing that there are about 44% uh, of people are not having access to health care and almost about 50% not accessing uh, medication. So the point being made here is that when we turn our attention to the problem at hand, we usually forget that there are other diseases, there are other issues that needs to be addressed and um, these are one of the key lessons that we must look at immunization suffers uh, maternal and child health issues uh, are not addressed so this is areas that governments can uh, look into what are some of the recommendations i'll make this quick i mean a few uh, one one is investment in health system and we we can't get away from investing in the six pillars uh, of, of the of, of the um, the health system that the uh, health strengthening system that has been put in place it is high time that we stop flying to other countries when we have a problem either our, our leaders or those of us who can afford it africa needs to invest uh, in its human capacity in its infrastructure in vaccines and co we must also build and improve on our understanding of diseases that affect us infectious diseases uh, do some projections around them do some profiling and modeling around them so that we will be able to predict and prime ourselves to respond to this. All this takes investments and uh, the investments is governments must put a bit more into the, the healthcare as had been promised from Abuja and other things. So these are some of the lessons that we can pick from the current uh, COVID crisis and, and some of the recommendations that we can better prepare ourselves so that we respond to next epidemic much better. Thank you. Thank you so much for that response. Um, so we have um, a question uh, which I will merge with another question. So in, in terms of achieving herd immunity, um, uh, so um, Professor Janine, I, I will direct the question to you. What do you think the epidemiological factors um, are to achieve uh, herd immunity, especially in places where herd immunity can't be achieved, for example, by mass vaccination because they're remote areas, they don't have um, vaccination programs in place. Um, how do you think we should address uh, the concept of herd immunity and how to measure it? What are the epidemiological factors that will contribute to it? Um, uh, can you give us some insight um, from your expertise in public health? So herd immunity, I mean, as an immunologist, I think about it probably very differently from public health modelers, um, but I am interested in the health systems aspect of achieving um, uh, herd immunity, either by natural infection or vaccination. Um, so. Um, maybe I will direct the question actually to Francesco, if you want to give us some insight from mathematics and modeling on, um, um, you know, you, you, you spoke a little bit about the R factor um, and transmission. Um, so how can we, you know, properly model herd immunity in a way that um, we can predict the outcomes based on um, natural infection and transmission or vaccination programs? Um, the question is from McGill University from Rhinel uh, uh, Fugion, and um, I probably um, remixed the question a little bit, but uh, you get the main gist of it. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess from um, so from the mathematical perspective to to, to model herd immunity, um, the, the way that I've seen is just a, a, a clear definition of if a sufficient proportion of the population. Uh, can't contain or propagate the virus, then by natural probabilistic means, the virus will will die out on its own, or it simply will have difficulties in propagating. And I think that the the way that this can tie in to again surveillance, vaccination, and testing strategies is is precisely having this be an objective um, of obtaining um, and uh, of obtaining herd immunity amongst the population that is actually um, freedom of. So so I think here the 
the the mathematical insight is to that that I would take as somebody who works more in operations research and and computer science. It would it would be to look at the list of uh, the space of mechanisms. What can we do? We can decide whom do we test. We can decide whom do we um, whom do we vaccinate, etc. And and ultimately compare this say via simulation um, on how um, the long term infection rates are of a given population. Um, and, and I think I also wanted to, it, it's important to tie this back. I think what, what, what Robert was saying a little while ago is ex- incredibly important, which it might not necessarily be the key, the, the right objective might not necessarily be to um, achieve her, herd immunity, say, or reduce the R-naught value. Um, perhaps given all of these after effects or unintended consequences of the virus. And I think it's maybe important, um, and I, this perhaps comes after much time and repeated learnings, as maybe has been the case with uh, having to deal with Ebola and then COVID to, to for example, say, perhaps it's a, a, a toy example would be that rather than thinking about just the death rates that are attributable to COVID, that perhaps an objective might be to minimize hospital loads um, in o- over a population. And the reason for this being that a higher hospital load has the unintended consequences in general of overly, of deaths beyond the baseline that would have happened for other diseases or for other health conditions, for maternal health, et cetera. And so, so this objective is it's, it's subtle and, and non-trivial and beyond that, that, that of herd immunity. And, and this is the very difficult question that definitely as computer scientists and mathematicians, we have no idea on how, what, what the right objective is, but we can at least um, start a conversation of thinking, should we think about a broader objective that encompasses the, the, the effects that, that, that come from um, not just the virus throughout time, but also the implementation of solutions. And this is something that we've seen. I mean, for example, we could just uh, isolate everyone and have everybody stay at home in this, but this is in certain places has catastrophic consequences socioeconomically as well. And so I think that also um, we, they're, 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 we get this trade off of at what cost do we um, obtain uh, immunity? And, uh, and I think we, it, it's just important to and maintain these trade-offs in, in the conversation too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So w- as infectious disease scientists, we talk a lot about r not and the R-factor. Um, uh, would you like to explain what the terms mean? Uh, because I don't think they're actually very accessible to the public. So it's actually a, a very simple concept. Um, um, I wish Dr. Janine was able to speak, <laughs> but uh, Francesco, can you um, explain just in, in basic terms what the term actually mm-hmm. refers to? So, so for the R factor, I think the easiest way to think about it is um, if, in, if a person is infected, on average, how many other people will they infect? And, um, and the, the, the larger, you can think about this maybe as a, if you have a completely uninfected population and it's very densely connected and you're able, and if you infect many other people and if many other people infect many other people, you get this cascading exponential effect. And, and we hear this term exponential growth all the time, but what this means is it, uh, the one way of thinking about it is this kind of like, if you have a factor of two, is this doubling process. If you take a number like rabbits that are reproducing, they just double and double and double and double. In very few iterations, you have enough rabbits to cover the, the earth. And so this this is the type of, it's it's a mes- method of way of quantifying how much that growth is. And so uh, we want to keep this r not value below one so that if you're infected on average, you infect less people or less than one. And this actually ends up being uh, a key measure of how you can keep the, the, the virus under control. I hope that's a, a, a somewhat accessible. Oh, yeah, that's fantastic. <laughs> I will definitely use the rabbit analogy when I try to explain <laughs> the <infection> disease spread. <laughs> it's actually a fantastic analogy. You have one rabbit, it can give birth to one, can give birth to five. This is how you can predict the log um, or exponential growth uh, of transmission, uh, which is what we've been seeing in COVID. Um, mm-hmm. So. I'll take this back to um, uh, Dr. Alpha. Um, so there's a question both that I, I actually plan to ask and also uh, it came from the audience. So we, we talked a lot about investment in healthcare structures, um, but what about investment in, in research capacity during the pandemic? Um, it's very tempting to to move all the resources away from um, basic science and research just into operational funding, you know, funding the hospitals, funding the healthcare workers. Um, and, um, um, you know, it, it provides less incentives to actually invest in basic science. Um, so what are your thoughts on um, how governments can move um, on, on funding basic science um, or 
not necessarily basic, it could be translational, but moving into research as opposed to operational. Okay, I wanted just to say, uh, I'm sorry, I don't know what is going on. Um, I wanted just to say that I think there's a lot that we need to do. Um, first of all, we need to do a quick assessment. We now have many countries are having mild coronavirus cases at home. I think we need to understand and to have a quick assessment on the state of, of infrastructure. I'm saying about the infrastructure, we need also to put to set up a community surveillance system that is capable to detect, predict, and diagnosis and manage also COVID cases. So in this regard, digitalization is the way to go. And lastly, I wanted to talk about the laboratory system that need to be uh, well strengthened and also communicated within or within the region and within the country. And and also, I wanted also to talk about um, you know someone was talking about health and uh, universal health access. I think this is something that we are seeing with COVID that if we if our population is not protected, it's so hard for them to go even for COVID. We are seeing cases uh, in US and many other countries where uh, if the access is still a problem, we, it's, there's no way we can fight this uh, pandemic over. Thank you so much, Professor Janine. Um, so uh, moving on from investments and research, and we had a lot of uh, questions about that, but I think the panel has addressed it. Um, I think diagnosis is a really hot topic. Um, and um, it has been a major hindrance we heard today about pool testing, for example. Uh, but um, as we know, supply chain of, of many of the diagnostic technologies is a huge problem, uh, not just in Africa, but actually globally um, at this point. Um, so um, speaking from a very Afrocentric point of view, what do you think we can do to secure that supply chain of diagnostics and also invest in um, uh, research and development uh, so that we have a smoother um, uh, containment of, of viruses like bo uh, both Ebola and COVID-19. Um, so I'll, I'll direct the question uh, first to Francesco um, and then to Dr. Robert. Um, well, thank you for the question and this is this is really important and um, and, and this is work that uh, that we've been working on both actually in Mexico where which in a similar scenario where very limited resources the supply chain can be very fragmented and we're beginning to work with in Ethiopia with with Akhari as well um, but but essentially the, the solution that a possible solution that I would posit along the lines of our work is the, to indeed think about fixing some of these issues with the supply chain and, and resources that exist but also possibly embrace the fact that resources are limited and use and namely then try to optimize the usage of resources given these limited constraints and uh, to give you and this is where pool testing for example is a fabulous resource um, and it's something that we've been working with extensively um, because essentially um, the, the the question that we posit is say that for example you have a village of 10,000 people but you only have 100 tests available and it doesn't even have to be 100 tests available overall ultimately testing it's important for it to be done quickly there's no it's of no use to learn of a result of a test three weeks later and so if you're ultimately only able to give say 100 tests immediately then the question is what do you do with them um, who do you give them to and especially if you can use pool testing then you actually have a, a huge functionality available to you and some of the possible solutions that are, um, well, it, it, I guess, innovative in a certain sense that we propose is to, for example, um, forego um, giving an individual diagnosis to, to people. Say if you, if you have 100 people, 100 tests and multiple people, then perhaps what you can do is just simply take group tests of the largest sizes. You might not necessarily know individually who has a virus amongst a positive group, but at the same time, you can you can tell all these people in the group, you know what, it could be the case that you have the virus, you are in a positive group, and then tell these people to self-isolate and increase the reach of a limited amount of tests. And, and, and how you do this, namely what group sizes you pick, um, where do you allocate tests in the population can be, again, formulated as an optimization problem. I mean, it could be the case if, if you're foregoing individual diagnosis, then public health professionals, for example, you don't want to necessarily put them into uh, doctors, for example, you don't want to put them in large groups where they might unnecessarily be told to self-isolate because they're it's or people with a uh, very difficult socioeconomic means to self-isolate. These people you might want to put into smaller groups so that you mitigate the probability of them accidentally being told to self-isolate. At the same time, if you have, say, people who are working at a marketplace who meet many, many other individuals who are potential super spreaders, then you're probably going to want to say, for example, pack as many of those people as possible into groups, 
because you want to cover that segment of the population and make sure that you don't um, that an individual who has the virus doesn't go unnoticed. And, and all of these uh, all of these interesting kind of non-trivial constraints to the problem um, they, they give rise to an interesting choice. And and again, we can embrace the fact that these constraints exist and and perform non-trivial testing. It, it's not immediately clear that you should just try to know everybody's diagnosis perfectly. This has worked for Korea, for example, or other places with extensive testing, but this is just not the reality in other places. And so we have to take a step back and rethink what we're trying to achieve with these limited resources. Dr. Robert? <clears throat> okay, okay. So to add to Francesco's uh, uh, of, uh, contribution, and I might use your rabbit a rabbit's uh, explanation for I don't know, uh, and next time I'm explaining it somewhere too. Um, just to say that um, we, we must invest in solutions, and it's not only diagnostics, but in vaccines and, and, and other supplies. It, it's something that, that, that is important. Um, and these investments uh, we, we should be uh, public private partnerships because these are areas in where the returns may not be immediate. I mean, you can be investing in, in these areas for a while before um, the returns come to it. So it should be go government putting money uh, towards and supporting uh, uh, institutions that can do this. Yes, I was also going to speak about um, uh, just collaborations across the continent among the, 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 the various institutions on the continent where, where in the, the labs in, 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 in the regional laboratory hubs that we have, I think about five of them across the continent. Um, and then the national laboratories as well to partner uh, with uh, the private sector in looking at how uh, these uh, diagnostics can, can be produced uh, across the continent and then also with acad the academia. So I think that there's a lot of work that needs to be done. This ties into your research question. There's a lot of research that needs to be, to be done and translated uh, into, into, into pro uh, production with a strong support from government and the private sector in investing uh, in, in these solutions. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Dr. Alpha, do you have any additional comments on testing and, and new novel methods uh, like pool testing or other technologies um, to maximize uh, diagnosis capacity in Africa? OK, voilà. Je, 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 je pense que ça peut être uh, une alternative sérieuse, par exemple, pour uh, les pays uh, qui n'ont pas beaucoup de moyens, les pays africains souvent, uh, le pooling dans les tests permet, permet dans une certaine mesure euh, d'absorber un nombre important de personnes et de pouvoir réaliser des tests sur un grand nombre de personnes avec peu de réactifs. Donc, je pense que c'est une technologie qui est à, à, à mieux mettre au point pour permettre de faire des résultats fiables mais également euh, faire en sorte que le maximum de personnes puissent être testées. Donc, euh, il y a certains pays qui l'utilisent déjà, euh, des, des, des tests de mise au point sont en cours dans, dans certains pays, par exemple en Guinée, dont nous faisons euh, actuellement dans nos laboratoires des tests de mise au point qui donnent des résultats assez prometteurs, et je pense que c'est des... C'est une technique qui permettra de pouvoir absorber le, un, un grand nombre de personnes et pourquoi pas utiliser cette technique pour faire un, un dépistage massif en population dans la majorité des pays d'Afrique. Thank you. Uh, I apologize again for not speaking French. So if anyone has, um, uh, you know, um, is bilingual, can you? post additional comments in the chat uh, so we can incorporate them in the discussion. I have a really fun question from um, Hamad Yaqub um, from Ames, uh, which is um, basically, um, how can we predict uh, how behavioral changes basically will impact um, uh, COVID transmission? Um, what new, you know, uh, fun mathematical models we can use so we can predict, you know, for example, when the schools reopen or when the schools close, when bars open, when um, restaurants open, um, 
how can we predict that changes, behavioral changes or different societal changes will actually impact transmission using mathematics? I, I have a couple of notes on that if, if, if it's interesting. Um, and this is an incredibly interesting and, and very apt question. And it's in line with, um, so there's a, a branch of, uh, at least of, of mathematics, a first order that you um, approximation for this behavior, you could maybe look at with game theory. And it's something that we, uh, within my field of computational economics do sometimes where you, and this is, this is, we're running into this right now with the testing policy, for example, that we propose with group testing, where essentially you set a system for, for example, perhaps you use population level attributes to decide who is going to be tested or to decide who is going to be vaccinated, let's say, which is, a, you know, a reasonable policy from the government perspective. And if there's some sort of information collection that goes along with this, then people do have incentives that you can, in some cases, model. So, for example, if if um, if an individual wants to return to work and gets a certain benefit from returning to work, then you can model their incentives in terms of what actions they can take that may or may not affect their probability of getting a test and therefore being able to return to work. And now, if you are attributing tests to, say, vulnerable segments of the population, which I don't know if this is a reasonable policy or not, but if that is the case, then a person might, for example, be incentivized to misreport their vulnerability so that they obtain a test and so that they're given free clearance to go back to work. And these things you can clearly model within a game theoretic context. And there is a, a really interesting branch of work on what we call the incentive compatibility of mechanisms. Are people in it? And we usually try to create systems in such a way that it's in people's best interest provably so, to be honest about whatever attributes they may have. Um, and this is definitely a, a super important um, area of research that uh, is, is very non-trivial too. So any insights with that are greatly appreciated, I think, by, by many of us. Thank you for that. Um, so um, I have one last question that I'll take from the audience and then uh, uh, leave the panelists to give final um, comments. So um, what are the factors that predict that someone will be asymptomatic? So um, um, I know a lot of the transmission risk has been caused by people feeling well while having a high viral load and potentially transmitting to other people. Of course, if you have symptoms, it's easy to think that you know you should isolate even though people don't always <laughs> follow that. Um, but, you know, asymptomatic transmission is a huge topic in, in um, COVID-19 more so than Ebola. Um, so what factors uh, contribute to that? Um, are there any comments from uh, the panel to address that? Professor Janine, I, I will let you speak. I know the audience can hear you even if we can't hear you here. So please go ahead. I, I think there are many factors. I think, um, uh, First of all, you, the immune system is very, so you have to have a very strong immune system. Young age is also uh, some other factors that now, you know, we are seeing more young um, population getting affected with COVID. But, you know, in the past, um, young age was uh, factor protecting. You know, the way you eat nutrition status is also so part of um, the factors that will make your immune system strong. I think uh, my message here today is uh, try to keep yourself safe. Um, eat well, rest uh, enough, and do sport so that we don't have comorbidities. Um, that's where also we see a lot of people um, going into the severity just because they bear uh, some comorbidities. All right. Um, with that, um, I think we're approaching the end of the panel. Are there any final one sentence <laughs> comments or, or lessons that we've learned from uh, COVID and Ebola that we want to leave the audience with? I was going to say that we, we've uh, spoken uh, about preparedness and uh, capacity building investments and other things, but one area we haven't uh, talked about is uh, risk transfer, uh, which is uh, situations where countries will insure themselves against these health uh, outbreaks uh, and epidemics or other uh, um, uh, disasters. This is an area that the Africa Risk Capacity is working in, um, and uh, we can be looking at transferring risk in such a way that when an outbreak occurs, a country will receive uh, a payment very quickly to be able to support its uh, response mechanism. So while we're looking at preparedness and co we could also look at innovative ways of uh, meeting, mitigating against these when they occur. Thank you. Thank you very much. We are unfortunately approaching the end of our session. Um, so I will pass it on to our MC, um, uh, George Ndrango. Um, if you can say final words. 
Yes, uh, absolutely. Dr. Sarah, I've been listening in. I've been listening into the conversations happening. Um, it's been healthy. I've, I've tried to jump back and forth the sessions, but uh, of course this tech doesn't allow us. I heard something about um, uh, being said about Rwanda, for example, when you started about how the rest of the world was mentally able to prepare for COVID. Even aside from the technical bits and preparation that came after, the rest of the world was ready. And then Francisco mentioned something. I've also tweeted um, something. You mentioned something about how uh, governments, depending on, on just one particular algorithm, would face some bit of you know back and forth. But it's very valid what you're saying. Like, do we do we roll it out to the people who are more uh, uh, likely to be affected or more at risk, or do we roll it out to the people who are spreading the risk? So that was a very solid point. So Dr. Alpha, uh, Robert, we've really had such a fantastic uh, set of conversations. I could see um, people asking so many questions. So at whatever point, if you'd also like to go through the Q&A and even network with people at the lounge, I'm sure they'll really enjoy that. Dr. Sarah, uh, that was fantastic. So at least you did ask the questions as much as you were asked in the previous session. So thank, thank you. Thank you very much.